Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Giles Brandra. Giles is a writer, broadcaster, actor, and former MP. He's a star of Celebrity Gogglebox, a veteran of QI, and have I got news for you, a reporter on The One Show, a regular on This Morning, and for many years has appeared on BBC Radio 4's Just A Minute. Giles has written a whole host of books, including detective novels, biographies, and his autobiography, Odd Boy Out, which came out last year. He's married to writer and publisher Michelle Brown, and they have three grown-up children and seven grandchildren. Giles Brandreth, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. How are you? Oh, it's a couch, is it? Well, if you tell me it's a couch, I'm sitting comfortably. Then we can begin, Jason. Can I ask if you can tell me about a significant bereavement you've had in your life, Giles? Yes. In fact, I can probably tell you about several. One of the reasons I'm doing this is I'm a great admirer of the work of Marie Curie and have been for a number of years because in my family, there's been uh, quite a bit of cancer. And I have lost family and friends to cancer over the years. And Marie Curie have played a part in those stories, always a positive one, which is why I'm here supporting Mm -hmm. the cause. Um, To choose a significant death, my goodness. Well, in a sense, um, every, every death is significant. And sometimes it's the unexpected deaths that turn out to be the most significant or more significant than you might necessarily expect. Uh, I was thinking about that because I I brought along today um, two poems to read to you. And um, I'll read one of them to you right now. I wasn't going to read it till the end of our conversation, but I might read it to you right now because uh, it it isn't doesn't reflect the most significant death I've known, but it reflects one that um, affected me, or rather the aftermath uh, affected me. Uh, I have two friends who live near me. One was the artist Jan Pinkowski. You may remember him. He was a brilliant artist, and he created the drawings for Meg and Mog and Owl. Do you remember these children's illustrations? his children's books. I do. They were fantastic. And he uh, had a lifelong partner, also an artist and a ceramicist, called David Walser. And uh, Jan died at the beginning of this year, and I went to the funeral. Uh, And uh, um, Jan had been failing for for some years. And these two guys were partners for a lifetime, 60 Mm -hmm. years or more. Delightful, brilliant people. Anyway, David, at this uh, funeral, read a poem that he had written that very week, inspired, in a sense, by the death of his best friend, his partner. And I found it very touching. And so uh, it it affected me. Uh, Written literally in the week, his lifelong partner, fellow artist Jan Pikowski, died back in February 2022. It goes like this. Flowers come, they bloom and go. We loved them, and we miss them so. The same with friends. They come, they grow. And then, one day, they up and go. We loved them, and we miss them so. Now, that short poem has really affected me. It's, it's why I've got it in my head. I carry it around with me, because it's about friendship. Mm-hmm. It's about life. Uh, like flowers, friends come, they grow, 
And then one day they up and go, and we love them and we miss them so. And so much for me seems to be wrapped up in that. So you ask me for a significant death, and curiously that of Jan Pinkowski, artist who I knew quite well, indeed over 50 years, and admired hugely, but he wasn't a close, intimate friend. He was a, a friend and neighbor. But his death has affected me because of the the beautiful response to it by his wonderful uh, lifelong partner, who is also uh, a great friend of mine and who loves poetry. I, I love poetry, which is why I've got another poem that I want to read to you later. But I suppose if you want to know about deaths that have affected me, I, I'll give you two obvious ones. Um, I have three sisters and they're all older than me all born before the Second World War. I was born after the Second World War, and they were born either the, just before the Second World War or during it. And my sister Hester died of cancer a few years ago uh, in a hospice on the Isle of Wight. And I, uh, I was uh, affected by it, of course, because um, I loved her and she was my sister. And she was young in the sense she was only 61, which is nowadays a very young age at which to die. Um, it wasn't a total surprise that she died. Uh, in her life, she had smoked a good deal, and we do have quite a bit of cancer in our family. But nonetheless, it was a shock. Uh, I was in the Isle of Wight, and I was with her when she died. And what was interesting to me, and with, with other members of her family, her daughter and other members of the family were all there in the room, and I remember the moment that she died. And she had been a person full of fire and energy. She was a, a marvelous, uh, remarkable figure, strong and entertaining and interesting, and had a, a very interesting life, sometimes troubled, but ultimately triumphant. And um, anyway, she died. And what was interesting was the moment she died, her energy left the room. And what has fascinated me ever since is wondering where that energy went. It just vanished. So uh, her death was is something that was significant to me. But of course, I remember my father's death. I've been thinking about these things. Um, and on the whole, I, I don't uh, think about things that are... I, I, I'm a great believer in looking up and looking out, not looking down and looking in. Uh, I'm not much given to introspection. Uh, I think, as it were, my I have a, a positive view of the world. And, I, and uh, I'm, I'm with Jung, uh, Carl Jung, the uh, great psychoanalyst who I think did research into, he, and towards the end of his life, he looked back over the cases of patients of his, and he found the ones who had been happiest in life were the ones who looked up and out, who had an interest in the world beyond themselves, in art, in nature, in science, in, in the world beyond themselves. Also, incidentally, he found that people who had a faith seemed to be happier, not necessarily a religious faith, but a line of, a line of belief, something they could hold on to in life. So I'm not somebody who is particularly introspective, but I, during lockdown, I, I wanted something to do. And I'm very lucky because I do a lot of different things. So one door closes, I can open another and do something else. And so doing shows and being on TV stopped for a while. But I thought, oh, well, I can write a book. And my publishers wanted me to write a childhood biography, autobiography. And I was a bit reluctant because of this reluctance to be introspective. And also because I just finished a book about the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, the Queen's late husband. And I knew that he was somebody who was very much against introspection. Um, and, you know, he always used to say, don't talk about yourself, talk about other people. But anyway, my publisher said, write this book about yourself. And so I began, my, my wife said, if you're going to do this, do it properly, Giles. Don't just do the usual superficial stuff, writing about, you know, your funny jumpers and the teddy bears and all that larky stuff. If you're going to write this, actually think about who you are, where you've come from, what you are. And I wrote this book. It's called Odd Boy Out. Though as I was writing it, I kept wishing it was called I Hope There Is a Heaven, because I, I do hope there is a heaven, because I would love, as it were, my, my mm. father, my sister, others who've gone before, uh, to know, A, how the story ended, and also to know how much uh, I appreciated and, and loved them. But actually, writing your own story isn't always a totally comfortable experience, even if you've had, as I have, broadly speaking, a very happy life. But anyway, that stopped me in my tracks, and I had to think about my parents, both of whom are dead, and indeed my sister, uh, who had died, and other friends who had died. I had a, um, my best friend from school, an actor called Simon Cadell, uh, 
Some of people listening may remember him from Heidi High. We were friends at school. He's my best friend. He died in his 40s. I had a lot of friends who died in their 40s. My sister died at 61. My brother had a brother of 51 who died of asbestosis. Anyway, so I'm not unfamiliar with death. And also, I come from a family that involves undertakers. Okay. Um, I'm not letting you say very much, Jason, only because you've started me yeah. on a, a roll here, and so Go I'm just it. burbling away. But I have a family who's involved in undertaking. I remember the first time I, I, I went to, the first sort of active connection I had with death was when my uh, I went with my father to make the arrangements for my grandmother's funeral. And I must have been, this was the 1950s, I was a very little boy. I wasn't even 10 years of age. And I went with my father to the undertaker and he said, we're going to Kenyans. They're the family undertakers. They are family. You must always be sure to ask for a discount. <laughs> and I remember my father going, I don't remember really much about this, except I remember my father going in to the undertakers and saying to the man behind the desk, we're family. Um, we, we have the family discount. Well, the man wasn't going to argue. He agreed to give us the family discount and then showed us the, um, the caskets. And my father made lots of nervous jokes. Um, anyway, uh, so I began writing this book, Odd Boy Out. I have thought about my parents and members of my family who've died. I've thought about death. Um, and um, it's been, I don't know whether it's been therapeutic, I don't know, but it was it was a good thing to do and to have written it down and to have told the stories, the funny stories and the sad stories. Sadder, of course, in the case of my sister and brother and my friend Simon Goodell, because they were younger people. My father at least achieved his three score year and 10. Talking and preparing can make life better at the end. Find more inspiration, support and tools, including our conversation cards, to get you thinking and talking about the end of life at mariecurie.org.uk forward slash talkabout. One of the aims of this podcast, Giles, is we want to encourage people to have conversations about death and dying because we know that not everybody does. You know, of course, not all the time. But I think certainly if somebody's been diagnosed with a terminal illness and or someone's grieving, then, um, you know, how can we support and encourage people to have some of these conversations like you and I are having today? And I was interested, you talked a bit about your sister, was it Hester, who was on the Isle of right um mm -hmm. and and it sounds like as a family you, you've been able to have conversations about death and dying from from a kind of pl planning point of view so what some of your sister's wishes were for her death and or her care were you having any conversations with her about those things at that time or was she having them with anybody else well, two things to say here. One is that I'm quite relaxed about people who want to be more reticent. We state as fact that it's good to share, good to be open about these things, because that is our experience, that is our instinct. But there may be other people who have different experiences who feel differently about it. So I, I don't presume to feel that everybody must be open about these things. In our family, of course, when I was growing up, Something like cancer was never referred to. I mean, literally, if it was referred to at all, it was the big C. It, it really, even though there were so many members of my family who had it, it really wasn't referred to. My my father's sisters, two sisters he had, both of them died of, of cancer. One, she became so thin, I remember, she she was literally blown over in the street. She'd become so thin within the family, we, we knew that she had the big C. I, I may have overheard my parents talking in those terms, but in hushed voices, they wouldn't really have voiced it out loud. And, and another of my father's sisters, um, I think she wasn't told that she had cancer. And I seem to remember my, my parents thinking that they would go to Lourdes to get some um, holy water from in the hope of a miracle. And they brought the water back from Lourdes but because she had not been told that she had cancer, how were they going to administer this holy water to her, hoping for the miracle? So they decided to put it into her coffee. And they made her some coffee and gave her the, um, uh, the coffee, and she still died. And my father complained to the local priest who had taken them on this pilgrimage to Lourdes to get this holy water. He said, look, 
it, it uh, you know, we, we got, went all the way to Lourdes, we got the holy water, and still my sister died. And uh, the priest said, well, how did you give her the holy water? And my father said, we, we made her some instant coffee. He said, you boiled the water, you boiled the efficacy out of the water. Of course, the miracle didn't happen. So um, we, we, we laughed. Perhaps that's a, a tasteless story, but it's a, it's a true story. But people of that generation didn't talk about it. When you get down to, as it were, my generation, my sister's generation, we did talk about it because of my aunts dying of cancer, my father dying of cancer. Uh, Hester um, was, interestingly, not aware when she first got it. She began to feel ill about a year before she died. Um, and uh, then, as it were, she was overwhelmed at the end by it and went into the hospice uh, where she uh, she wanted to stay at home as long as she could and um, didn't go until pain was overwhelming her and she needed pain control to, to help her. Uh, and she was an open person. So that was her approach to life would be to talk about things. She'd always been, she was a, a bit of a campaigner. She was gay uh, at, at a time when that was not, um, it was something you didn't necessarily talk about, you know, in the 1960s. Um, uh, and, you know, coming from a very straightforward middle-class family, my father was a solicitor, my mother was a teacher, um, and they were very embracing of her, very loving of her. But she talked openly about that before it became fashionable. She had in her life challenges with her mental health and uh, with drink for a while. She became a very active member of AA and a great proselytizer for the cause. She was a marvelous helper of other people. So she was open because she found it useful. But mm. I think what she was good at, and what I'm trying to say is it's horses for courses. You've got to understand how people, not everybody wants everything laid out starkly. Some people mm. want a more tentative approach. My mother, for example, had mixed feelings about um, the hospice. My father ended up in two different hospices. And my mother at first, when she was finding it very difficult to accept that he was going to die because they'd been together well, all their lives. They, they, they met when they were very young. And, um, you know, so they'd been together forever. And my mother was totally dependent on my father. She couldn't literally could not change television channels. And this is in the day you only had BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. She couldn't go from BBC One to ITV without him changing the knob. She couldn't, she didn't, she didn't have a bank account herself. She was entirely dependent on him. And they were, as it were, inseparable. And she didn't want to accept that he was going to die. And I remember her saying when we came to the hospice on the first occasion, she said, there should be a sign above here that says, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. That was before she understood what actually was happening in the hospice. And how indeed many people came out of the hospice and, as it were, came and went over a period of time where they were having their pain controlled. And it was a, a journey on which we all are going. And, and, that's quite a difficult thing to accept. And she didn't want him to die. She didn't. She didn't. Well, I mean, I remember being it was in the Middlesex Hospital uh, in London. It doesn't exist anymore, but I, it's where all my children were born. It was a hospital we knew well. One of my sisters was a staff nurse there. In fact, I think a sister there. Um, and I remember my mother banging the desk in front of the consultant saying, you must stop this. He mustn't die. You must stop this. Uh, and she had to go through that phase um, of coming to accept the inevitable. And it's a, it's a journey for us all. And it was interesting for her because she was a person for whom her faith was everything. And so there are no easy glib answers no, to no. any of this. And so everybody will discover their own journey. Recently, I give you a marvelous example of somebody I think, um, I mean, I've known a number of people. My friend Simon Cadell, the actor, was one, and he's another actor I'm going to mention now called Peter Bowles, who died very recently. He was a friend and neighbor of mine. People remember him from ser television series like To the Manor Born, uh, Rumpole of the Bailey, um, uh, the Irish RM, great actor, a great stage actor as well, and a very amusing man. And uh, he had uh, cancer, and he knew he had cancer for two years. Now, his 
approach was totally different to that of uh, some people that I would know. He was totally accepting of it. I've got it. We'll do what we can. We'll get what treatment we can. We'll explore every avenue. We'll fight it while we can. And then when we can't fight anymore, we will accept it. And he, to spare his wife, uh, we had, I remember having lunch with him only a few weeks before he died. He was in very celebratory mood. I said, you're, you know, good form today. He said, yes. He said, I've just been to The Undertaker. I said, oh. He said, excellent people. Excellent people. I recommend them. I said, well, I, I go to the family Undertaker. He said, never mind that. These people are the best. He said, I've just been in. And he'd been into The Undertaker to spare his wife. Mm. Also because he wanted to be in control. He went into The Undertaker. He booked the funeral. He paid for the funeral. He did all the paperwork so that his wife should be spared. He organized it all. And at the end, we came and had this celebratory lunch. And by then, the cocktail of drugs he was on meant he couldn't really taste food very much uh, or with any great pleasure or indeed wine, but he had a glass of wine just really for, for old time's sake. Um, and he felt he'd done the right thing. And indeed, he had done the right thing because we went to the funeral and it was beautifully organized. So uh, afterwards, we did raise a glass to him. But what this tells us is, you know, the world is full of very different people. And very different people have very different ways of approaching this journey. And there is no right and no wrong. And, and some people uh, want, you know, when you come to talk about these matters, you to put on a solemn Sunday face and talk in hushed tones. Others actually want you to be more businesslike and matter of fact. Uh, my friend Peter Bowles would not have wanted you to talk in a sentimental way. He'd have said, you know, well, we're only having this lunch once. I may not be here for the next one. Tell me a funny story. Make me laugh. And that's genuinely what he wanted. It wasn't a defense mechanism. He thought, while I'm alive, I'm going to be alive. And when I go, I go. But other people will have wanted a, a gentler approach to it. Someone like my mother uh, wanted a gentler approach. And, and she was very blessed in many ways. She lived to be 96 years of age, and she faded away more slowly. Um, and it was, her death was um, more, more peaceful and more beautiful in the sense that uh, she had been brought up in India, my mother, and her father was a soldier in the British Indian Army, and her mother was a missionary in India. And she was brought up in India. In fact, it's the part of India she was brought up in is now Pakistan. She was born somewhere called Rawal Pindi, which is right in the north mm -hmm. of the Indian subcontinent, almost, you know, almost up in Af Afghanistan. But uh, she left when she was 19 or 20, came to London where she met my father and, and went back on holiday. But she never returned to live in India. But she never left India. And when she died, the hospital she died in, in southwest London, there happened to be an Indian porter who was wheeling her from the public ward to the private ward because they knew that the end was coming and they put her in a private ward. And he was wearing a turban. And she was delighted to see uh, that. And she spoke to him in Hindi. Um, and it was very lovely for her, in a sense, at the end of her life, to go back to her childhood mm -hmm. with, with somebody who was Indian. And there they could, as it were, they held hands and they chatted away in, in Hindi, which was fantastic. So each to her or his own. I have no prescriptions to offer. Um, but I have this to say, actually. I've known, I mean, you get to my age, anyone listening to this who is my age, I was born in 1948. Um, uh, you will, you know, we always joke when we go to the funeral, it's hardly worth going home, is it? I mean, I, I will go to a funeral or memorial service literally sometimes once a week. And because I've reached the age where my contemporaries are beginning to go, and certainly all my parents' contemporaries have gone or are going, even if I'm lucky enough to know, and I do know some very lively living people in their, their 90s. I had a friend the other day who died aged 102. She was fantastic. Anyway, the lines by Dylan Thomas, uh, do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light, are wonderfully theatrical and melodramatic and written by a person who at the time he wrote them was full of energy and life. My experience of people when they are dying is that mostly they are 
accepting of it. I'm, I'm talking now of people who have lived a full life. I'm not talking about children, but I am talking about people who may be, my, for example, my friend uh, Simon Cadell, the actor, was 47 when he died. He was very accepting of it. I knew an actress called Linda Bellingham. You may remember her. She's the Oxo mum on TV. Uh, lovely lady, so funny. But I remember her calling me on the telephone oh, a few days before she died, saying, it's fine. I'm all right. It's absolutely fine. Really is. What I'm worried about, and then she mentioned her then boyfriend and her sons, she was worried about various things, but she was getting those sorted. Um, but she said, I'm fine. And in my experience, which is sadly not unextensive, um, people are very good at the end, very impressive. And actually, it's encouraging, since this is the journey we are all making. Can I ask, do you think about your own death? Uh, I have done. Um, I did a few years ago, and interestingly, it was a symptom of some sort of illness, which was intriguing, which was then dealt with. Um, I don't brood about it a lot. Uh, I have a, a lot in my family who have died, and I do think about that, and I'm accepting of it. And I'm consoled by the fact that most of the people I know who have died have been reconciled uh, towards the end of their lives, that this is the end of their life. And most of the people I know have made good deaths and impressive deaths. Of course, I've been fascinated about it for years in the sense that I remember when I was a small child, I was very lucky. I served as a server in a church called St. Stephen's in Gloucester Road. This is the 1950s when I was a little boy. T.S. Eliot, the great poet, was one of the sidesmen at this church. And there was a lovely priest there called Father Howard. And I remember once finding him in a room off the vestry. And there was a coffin in the room and candles around it, yellow candles, I remember. Anyway, uh, I said, what's this? And he said, this is a coffin. There's somebody lying here who has died. And, of course, he had faith. So he believed they'd died, but they'd been born again. And this, for them, was the beginning of the, the new adventure. And so I was introduced as a very small child to the, the positive side of death. I have no idea what there is beyond life. As J.M. Barry says in Peter Pan to die, must be an awfully big adventure. Who knows what the future holds? For those who have faith, that is wonderful. And I hope their faith is justified. It might be. Because as I told you when talking about my sister Hester, the moment she died, I was conscious of the energy leaving the room. And I've long wondered where that went. So I do think about it, but I'm not morbid. Um, I'm positive, And I think uh, life is for living. I was very lucky when I was at school. I had a headmaster who said to me when I was only about 10 years of age, I remember Brandreth, busy people are happy people. And I remember that, and so I keep myself busy. I'm out and about. I, I visit people, if I can, who are not well and who may be dying. I don't chat to them particularly about death. I don't, uh, if they want to, I'm ready to talk about it. But I'm not one, I'm really not one for saying that we must talk about this mm. in a sort of mm. serious way. If you want to talk about it, of course, let's talk about it. But let's not pretend that we know any of us what the answers are, what's on the other side. What we do know is that thanks to the hospice movement, thanks to outfits like Marie Curie, this inevitable end of life can be made more peaceful, more bearable. And therefore, the acceptance that in my experience comes to almost everybody who lives a foolish life, i.e. who grows to adulthood, it helps them. So it, it, it's a good thing. So death is part of life. There's nothing much you can do about that. Absolutely. But, you know, like you can't spend all your life thinking about a holiday. You can't spend all your life thinking about a great meal or a concert. Life is ups and downs. So don't spend all your time thinking about death. Of course, it is a preoccupation. But uh, can I tell you, I, I was saying this the other day to one of my nieces because her mother was very ill. And we'd, we'd been at the bedside for a while. And I said, come on, let's go and let's go and have a coffee. And then got to the street. I said, actually, let's go and have a drink and toast your mum. Let, let, let's do that. Uh, because these are sad times. Um, but you can be cheerful even in sad times. That's, in a sense, 
what my poem that I'm going to read you is all about. This is a poem uh, by somebody called Derek Mann. And among the books that I, I've written, and I mean, I'm, I'm in the happiness business. I wrote a book called The Seven Secrets of Happiness. But I also did an anthology of poetry called Dancing by the Light of the Moon. And this is poetry to learn by heart. And one of the things that my friend David Walser told me, he's the person who lost his lifelong partner, Jan Pinkowski, who wrote the poem that I read to you right at the beginning of our conversation. He has found my book, Dancing by the Light of the Moon, very helpful because he's been trying to learn some poetry by heart, both to, to distract himself, really, intelligently. Because, of course, it's bleak. You lose a lifelong partner. There's no denying it. Mm -hmm. It's bleak. You are alone. You've got a lot to be grateful for, but you are alone. You need company. And you, yes, you need family and you need friends. If you've got a pet, aren't you lucky? You've got your dog, your cat, your tortoise. That's marvelous. But you need company and you need your own company. And you need to do something with your head. Uh, and he has found learning poetry by heart is good. It is literally good for you. It helps keep things like dementia at bay, keeps the synapses supple. And you can go back to childhood poetry, like The Owl and the Pussycat. You know, relearn that. It's fun. Or learn new poems. And during lockdown, I did, oh, every day during lockdown, I did about 150 short poems every day. And one of the most popular was this poem by a man called Derek Mann, an Irish poet born in 1941. He died, in fact, I think during lockdown, not of COVID, but he, he did die recently. It's called Everything is Going to Be All Right. How should I not be glad to contemplate the clouds clearing beyond the dormer window? and a high tide reflected on the ceiling. There will be dying, there will be dying, but there is no need to go into that. The poems flow from behind the hand unbidden, and the hidden source is the watchful heart. The sun rises in spite of everything, and the far cities are beautiful and bright. I lie here in a riot of sunlight, watching the daybreak and the clouds flying. Everything is going to be all right. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie is here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 080 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. And the music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>